Hello my friends, how are you? Today we have a very special event, the world interview debut of James Biden Huggins and the premiere reveal fun Q&A for Sylvester Stallone upcoming film Hunter. Conducted by my friend Matt Thomas Mershon, we delve into what was once Rambo 5 and now set to be a part of an old new Sly franchise. Enjoy and from Badamak video, peace and love. Welcome back to Studio Red Band. Uh, tonight we have James Byron Huggins here, uh, writer of Kane, The Reckoning, and Hunter, as well as many other great works. Uh, James, man, thank you for coming on and doing this with us. Like, this is uh, something I've been waiting to do for such a long time, and I'm a huge admirer of your work. And the last 10 years I've been just following you, trying to catch up, and I, I just really wanted to thank you for taking uh, time out to, to get together with me. Oh, I love, man. I love doing this kind of thing. Uh, and uh, I love talking to uh, uh, people who like my work and uh, answering any questions that they have and uh, spending as much time as I can with them in any forum that they uh, are, you know, we can set up. Uh, and uh, so I'm just glad to, you know, be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, uh, we got some uh, awesome fan uh, Q and A questions, and then uh, we also have uh, some other questions we're going to ask later on. So with that, um, I guess let's let's get down to it and thank you once again. Oh, I'm I I I, I need to thank you. I, I'm I'm just glad to be here. Awesome, thank you. Our first question is from Greg Zablo over at the Stallone Zone. Amazing place, amazing wealth of knowledge. Um, you're going to learn a lot over there. Um, did you have anyone in mind for any of the side characters? Like the um, the lady who accompanies them on their journey or, you know, uh, some of the other people while you were working on Hunter? No. I wrote the novel only with the idea of Sylvester Stallone fulfilling the role of Hunter, I I didn't give any thought at all to the secondary character. Um, that's really not my forte. Mm -hmm. There are professional people who, who do casting, and I'm not sure what kind of criteria they use to decide who's best for what role. So I don't uh, concern myself with those things. Okay. Okay. Um, and the second part of his question was, uh, can you tell us a bit about the genesis of the project as a whole? I was called and asked to develop a uh, thriller for mm -hmm. Sylvester Stallone, and I did. I flew to New York, we met, and he liked the idea. And so it took me a year to write the novel. And during that year, we had discussions weekly about the development of the storyline and the character. And uh, of course, the story evolved greatly from the original uh, idea that I had because uh, Stallone contributed a great deal to the development of the story, mm -hmm. particularly the psych psychological part of it, which is the heart of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, really, uh, the novel belongs as much to Sylvester Stallone as it does to me. Awesome. That's really cool. Well, thank you, uh, Greg Zablo, for your question. Everybody should go down and check out uh, the Stallone Zone. And they should also check out First Blood 1982 fan site on Facebook um, by Reagan Grenard. And the next question comes from Reagan. And Reagan asks, really good friend of the show, both of these guys are really good friends. Uh, he asks, I'm trying to think of questions, but the main one I would like to pitch regarding the 2009 version of Hunter was either, uh, do you know if it was either to be set in Bowie or at least some kind of setting near Bowie where we last left Rambo? No, I have no, no specific location in mind other than being close to the Arctic Circle so that they would be totally isolated and 
there would be no chance for Hunter to find backup uh, in the battle he faces against the creature. He's totally alone. There, there is no force near that can help him. Next up, we have a question from Wallace Lee uh, from the Rambo Year One Works. All the way from Italy, another great friend of the show. And he asks, Mr. Huggins, around 2009, um, when Hunter was evaluated by Stallone as a possible adaptation for a, Hunter, uh, for a Rambo movie, um, when something like that happens to a writer, it could be a major breakthrough with his books translated worldwide overnight. With hindsight, uh, how did you live through the waiting part? of that well I always have about a half dozen irons in the fire so I was not overly concerned about the waiting part I had other books I had to be working on after I finished Hunter and I knew that a movie is a long-term project and so there was no reason to become anxious or impatient about it and Stallone would need time to, uh, to develop the project. And so I didn't, uh, uh, I didn't become agitated about the weight. Uh, okay. I, I, I just stayed busy with other projects, mm -hmm. other book, other novels that I was working on. And I, you know, published over the years since then. And, uh, so finally, you know, they're coming around to Hunter and developing it and, and I, I knew it would take a long time. Mm -hmm. Movies, all movies take a long time. Yeah. I believe why some directors prefer a TV series because a TV series is a, a short-term project. I mean, uh, they, they do it in a, a month. Yeah. But a, a movie could take, it might take 10 years to develop yeah. a movie. So, you know, you have to be patient and, uh, and uh, give people time to um, get everything in place. Okay. You know, yeah, I, I find like that's also a really good way to use the time too is to, you know, just wait it out and go work on something else. I find that's what I do when when I have like I'm, I always have a, a project going on inside. So it's always I find it's a really good use of the time is when when you have to wait for one thing, just go work on something else. And yeah, that's it, it's best to be patient with these yeah. things. Okay, so his second part of that question, um, he says he asks, uh, getting inside the crosshairs of one of the most acclaimed celebrity worldwide, um, was it more of a flattering experience, or anything else considering the app did? the adaptation was uh he says never confirmed but i guess he means never like like it wasn't made yet no uh getting to know stallone was not uh, a flattering experience it was an education uh, because stallone is one of the most well-read men i've ever met in my life mm -hmm. and i read three to five books a week myself but uh, Stallone uh, reads all the time, and uh, his his con contributions to the development of the story were really astonished me at times. Uh, the insight he had into uh, how to develop a character, he, he he has so much experience to draw on, and uh, and really he has so much knowledge because he's he's so well read. Mm -hmm. and well-rounded in his uh, education that uh, uh, I was constantly learning from him and that's what impressed me more than anything. I wasn't flattered, you know, just knowing him and working with him. I was, uh, I was impressed by how much I was learning from him mm -hmm. when I was writing the story. And uh, that was uh, that was uh, the strongest impression I had of, of the whole project. 
Mm-hmm. That's awesome. I, I know learning is my favorite part of any project too, is experience and learning. You know, those are the two things that, you know, you take with you wherever you go, you know? So. All right. All right. Thank you, Wallace, for your questions. Um, and now we have a few questions uh, from myself, Matt Thomas Marsha, Studio Red Band. Um, question one, I guess, would be, what got you into writing? Well, I've always uh, had a love for reading. And I began reading novels when I was as, as soon as I could look learned how to read mm -hmm. and uh it's just a natural uh love that i have for stories and uh poetry novels books on philosophy science theology uh, and uh i have a love for language and as i got older it just grew stronger and uh, I read more and more and more. And of course, you know, I had to, I worked overseas for a while and came back to the States. And I was a police officer for a while. And then finally one night, I had a family situation where my son got sick and I didn't have enough money to buy the medication that he needed. And I had to borrow money from all my friends to buy what he needed. And that night, I decided that I was going to write a book because I felt that I was strong enough to do it and uh, to, to write a, a significant book. And uh, so I took a, I didn't have, I didn't even have a desk. I took a mirror off of a, a dresser and laid it across two cardboard boxes, took out this old computer and set it up. And that night I began writing Wolf Story my first novel so i would go i would go to work as a police officer from two to ten get home about midnight and i would write from midnight till six in the morning on wolf story or it took me about 10 months to write wolf story like that and then it took me another you know six months to sell it and then it became a bestseller wow and uh that's how I wrote my, that was the, the genesis behind my career uh, as a novelist. And after that, uh, the acclaim I got from Wolf Story and the, the uh, 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 I just found my calling. I felt like I'd found my calling. And uh, I wrote another book and it was a bestseller. Then I wrote another book and it became a bestseller. <laughs> and, uh, uh, it's just gone from there. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. That's a really cool origin story. Um, another question I had was, uh, who were some of your inspirations? A lot of my inspirations are older writers like Bram Stoker, Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, I don't really favor Coleridge or uh, Tennyson, uh, uh, some of the, the greater known poets, mm -hmm. because uh, poetry is, I, I don't have the same love for poetry as I have for what I, I, what I call literature. Okay. Uh, now, I probably read Dracula 50 times, and uh, just studying the use of how to develop uh, a monstrous character. And uh, then again, uh, I, I have to give credit to uh, uh, the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. I've read Isaiah all my life. And Isaiah himself, whether you believe in God or not, doesn't matter to me, but Isaiah as a writer, has to be one of the greatest writers that has ever lived. Mm -hmm. I would rank him, uh, there's Shakespeare, I mean, there's Isaiah, uh, 
you know, there's other great writers, but Isaiah, I, I learned how to use metaphorical language by studying the book of Isaiah and uh, uh, descriptive language. Mm -hmm. And uh, people sometimes critique my work and they praise the use of description and uh, metaphors that I use. And I, I think every time I read something like that about myself, I think I'm, I, I absorbed all that by studying the book of Isaiah because he was such a master of it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and his, his variation of techniques, he didn't write in a singular mode. He would, he would switch modes to fit whatever new situation uh, he was trying to capture. Mm -hmm. And as far as the development of a monstrous character, uh, Edgar Allan Poe, he, he was great. Uh, and at, well, I would give Edgar Allan Poe more credit for atmospheric uh, content. Uh, I've studied him so much. Uh, now, now, everybody knows Edgar Allan Poe never wrote a novel. All he wrote were short stories and uh, reviews. But his short stories alone uh, are breathtakingly atmospheric, if, if gothic is your uh, taste. Okay. Just the first paragraph of The, of the House of Usher uh, is, a, is, a, is just, a, you can spend a week studying that one paragraph and, and you can master atmosphere. And then there's uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne who was a master of dialogue and uh, uh, and just pure storytelling. I mean, The House of Seven Gables, if somebody hasn't read it, they should, because uh, I've never read a novel in my life that uh, had better dialogue than, uh, than that novel. And uh, so I've spent my whole life studying how to become uh, a writer. I, I, I studied for 30 years, uh, three to five novels a week before I ever tried to do my first novel. Mm -hmm. During all that, I was doing some very hazardous work and I learned a lot from my own personal experience of how people, how, how you genuinely feel in these uh, hazardous uh, situations. Mm -hmm. And so I incorporated my real life experience with what I had absorbed over 30 years of studying how to learn, how to capture these things in words. And I put those two elements together and that's how I began writing. That's, that's how I developed, that's how my style uh, was awesome. uh, born. That's and, incredible. Uh, yeah, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes it takes a it takes a long time to yeah. uh, learn how to uh, uh, become uh, significant at any anything. Yeah, it's at, always practice, right? It doesn't matter whether you're a painter or a doctor or a lawyer or a writer yeah. or an actor. I mean, if you spend decades studying how to do it, then you're probably going to end up doing it pretty well. Yeah. That's, you know, again, that's the beauty part of it is, you know, you never stop learning. You just keep going and that that's amazing. Um, uh, my last question, I guess we're going to hear this question a, a lot tonight. Uh, I think we've heard it slightly before. Um, was how did Hunter come about? Well, Hunter has not has nothing in common with movies like Predator or uh, Universal Soldier or uh, any one of the Rambo movies. Hunter came about uh, through through a. Uh, it's an idea, but it's just a classical idea. 
of a man facing a creature that is stronger and faster and cut and just as cunning as he is and uh, uh, more even more skilled than he is at uh, killing mm-hmm. uh, if hunter has no resemblance to any uh, uh, beast movie that has ever been done except maybe uh, The Ghost in the Darkness which starred Michael Douglas which uh, featured The Lions of Sabo. Was that with Val Kilmer? Val Kilmer and Michael Douglas. That they was fascinating, these, that movie. These two uh, lions who were brothers uh, yeah. k- killed nearly 300 people and uh, they had to track them down and uh, uh, these lions were stronger, I mean, and faster than any normal lion. They were larger. Yeah. They were, and uh, and uh, and their cunning was uh, equal to any man's. And uh, it was like tracking a ghost in a mist to yeah. try and find one of them and kill them to stop them from slaughtering people. And I took. Uh, I was inspired by that idea, and I wanted to try and capture a story similar to it, and cap and capture a creature that would be equal to uh, something so dangerous, okay. and something that would be as so much stronger than a man, so much faster than a man, and uh, but just as cunning, and just as intelligent, and with the uh, darkest heart of the human mind uh and that's how i created the creature so hunter is outmatched in every way and he's alone yeah he has no backup but he has to find a way to take down this creature that is so much stronger than he is so much faster than he is and is just as cunning and just as intelligent has just as strong a will to survive as he does. And uh, I thought that that story, the, the conflict of a man facing a, such a creature, a creature like that and alone in such a desperate situation and in a de- such an isolated location would make a fascinating story. Yeah. Because you got, you have no, you have nothing on your side. You have yeah. no, you have no advantages at all. And I, this thing is like a ghost, and uh, and when it kills, it kills with the ferocity of 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 uh, an enraged lion or or tiger, mm-hmm. and 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 no man stands a chance. It would be like you trying to take down a tight a full grown lion with your bare hands. <laughs> Forget that. <laughs> so that's the kind of challenge <clears throat> in the novel. Yeah. And I, uh, I, I thought that it it was a role that only Stallone could fulfill. Mm-hmm. That's why uh, I was uh, uh, honored to work with him. And when I designed the book, I kept Stallone in mind through all the confrontations that occur in the book between the creature and Hunter. Mm -hmm. Because in every single confrontation, Hunter barely escapes with his life. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because this thing is just indestructible. Yeah. And it's it's got him beat. It's got him outmatched in every way until the final confrontation when it's just destiny, it has to end. There has to be an ending. Yeah. And only one of them can walk away this time. So Hunter either dies or he kills it. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I found that you, you captured you captured Stallone completely in that in in the in those pages. And, you know, 
Well, during the creation of the novel, I could not imagine anyone but Stallone playing the role of Hunter. Yeah. Just because of Stallone's uh, 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 natural uh, 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 I don't know how to describe it, his will to survive, his mm-hmm. toughness, his his strength, his uh, his intelligence. I, uh, I I couldn't imagine anybody else playing the role. Mm-hmm. Yeah, amazing, amazing. When like people out there, if you haven't read it, go read it. You'll you'll see for yourself. There's a it's it's a really great way that you capture both Sly's uh, Sly's uh, persona, but at the same time. What I liked about it too was you got like the scientist, well, like the homeless schematar, right? You got him who's very science smart, and then you have Hunter who's very, um, how do you call that? I don't want to say ethereal, but like earth, earth smart, like you know, elemental, elementally smart. And then when that beast comes out, you know, it's just like. It's just like it, it's like like worlds colliding, like two sides of the of the same coin almost colliding. It's very it's very hard to explain, but it's very amazing to see like both of these, you know, top food chain kind of things go head to head. And then when yeah. the beast element is is thrown in, you can see that the beast is is definitely far superior. And that just, you know, that just, boom. That just, you know, wow. Yeah, now this, this creature that Stallone faces in the uh, in Hunter is not like any creature that's ever been uh, created yeah. in any novel before and uh, or, or ever captured on in any movie. Uh, people mistakenly... Uh, compare it to movies like Predator or Universal Soldier or something like that, but it has no resemblance at all to uh, those uh, concepts. It's a uh, uh, it's a it's original mm. and uh, 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 to me it's uh, fascinating uh, to see a man so outmatched in a, such a desperate situation facing a creature more ferocious than any creature that has existed in a million years of mm-hmm. uh, and yet hunter has to find a way somehow to take it down and stop it before it reaches a populated area because the creature I'm not going to give away any spoilers, but if the creature reaches any sort of populated area, oh, it's game over. The consequences are going to be, uh, uh, just disastrous. And uh, so Hunter has to find a way somehow to stop this thing that even a million years ago, uh, it, it couldn't be stopped. Yeah. I, I thought what was cool about a lot of that too is like I remember going back to 2009 when uh, when Sly was talking on AICN with Harry Knowles when he left him that voicemail regarding Hunter that it wasn't going to be like you say it wasn't going to be like a Universal Soldier or like a Predator but it was like um, it almost <laughs> felt like it was like Nephilimistic like like people you know the gods of old. Comparison are people who have never read the novel. Yeah, the creature in the novel is so unique. Yeah, there there has never been anything like it in a novel, and yeah. uh, uh, that's uh, the story is just completely original. Mm-hmm. the The only similarity, the only commonality it has to uh, uh, any any anything any movie like that is that it is a uh, a, a, a man with extraordinary abilities but he is facing an enemy that is even more extraordinary mm-hmm. and uh and uh 
and uh, it has the advantage of, of of a psychology that man can't match. Uh, but Hunter has to find a way to match it mm-hmm. if, if he's going to destroy it, yeah. and it has to be destroyed. Uh, similar to the concept uh, so the situation, the true story of the lines of Sabo. I mean, they had to be stopped. I mean, they were just, you just can't have. Oh, yeah. For killing 300 people. And, oh, yeah. I mean. That that whole Ghost in the Darkness, that last act is so powerful. That's right. such a great, great movie. But but going back to the, the question, um, I'll just wrap it up by saying that, uh, yeah, I don't want to say. Uh, use the word Nephilim, but I found like it was very primordial, you know, like a primordial force that we've never seen, kind of thing. Well, if I talk about that part of the novel, I really will. Uh, I'll give a it'll, it'll, yeah. it will be a spoiler. Yeah, okay. Uh, we'll save that for another day. <laughs> the psychology of the creature that is the heart of the novel and the it, the darkest part. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, but, and it happens to be a concept that uh, Stallone uh, gave me. I I I didn't have the concept. I didn't when I began the novel. And he said, you know, you need to think about this. And uh, he gave me the idea of the psychology of the creature. And uh, you know, I had to research it. I had to read Freud and Jung and study it out for about three months. And uh, I finally began to hone in on what he was saying, and uh, then I tried to accurately capture it in words, and that was probably the most difficult part of that novel. It was capturing the mind of this creature, because uh, it is the dark part of the novel, and uh, it will be the the most fast one of the most fascinating parts. Of the uh, of the of the movie, if if they if they end up making it. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you for answering my questions, and uh, thank you every everyone uh, previous for your questions. And we're gonna we're gonna move on to the next question. All right. And now we have a question from Mr. Jack Craven, very good friend of the show, a uh, great friend in general. Jack has helped me out with just so many mysteries. Over the years, uh, really, just wow! What a, what a, what a like, just fantastic gentleman and fantastic wealth of knowledge. Also, um, Jack Craven writes, um, asks, as a Rambo and Stallone fan, I would like to know as much as possible about Sly's involvement in the possible movie adaptation of it, and any more details like actual confirmation um, that there was one or more scripts that were written for it over the years like Savage Hunt uh, that's all and thanks for for asking uh, my question to the best of my knowledge they have never developed a full blown script for the movie I don't know for sure uh, but I haven't been told that they have, so uh, I'm, I'm, and I don't like to assume that they haven't. Okay. Uh, they may have, they may have developed, they may have gone through a dozen scripts so far, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, just not been satisfied satisfied with any of them. But uh, 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 as far as I know, there has never been a full blown screenplay for the movie. Uh, I believe they're looking right now for the for the right writer mm-hmm. for the project, and uh, and uh, I'm sure that uh, they'll find the right person for the job. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jack, for your question, and thank you for answering that. All right. Okay, our next question comes from a really good friend of mine, Mr. Brent Whiteside, who is a very huge fan of yours as well and uh turned me on to a lot of your writings and 
And his uh, first question, he has four here. The first one is, um, if Hunter were made into a standalone film, which potential actors would uh, you feel are the most well-suited to take on uh, Nathaniel Hunter? Like before, uh, yeah. sometimes uh -huh. we have a lot of the same questions, but that's why people submitted multiple ones. I I can only say that the only, only actor I see playing the role of Hunter would be Sylvester Stallone. I cannot see anyone else uh, capturing the the ferocity and the uh, never give up attitude that Hunter has to have in order to take down this uh, in this almost indestructible creature mm -hmm. uh, there are probably actors that could do the role uh, that don't uh, are not in my mind right now mm -hmm. but I can't think of anybody uh, I couldn't think of anybody when I was else when I was writing the book and uh, I can't think of anyone now uh, that could uh, fulfill the role of Hunter Except uh, Stallone. Awesome. Um, he also asks, um, would you prefer, uh, com I guess comparing now to back in 2009, um, would you prefer that Hunter be made into a, you know, the standalone movie it, it, uh, it is now or as a Rambo installment or vice versa? Well, it would never, it would never work as a, as a hybrid Rambo Hunter movie because Rambo and Hunter are two very different characters. Yeah, polar opposites they're, in a way. Their Hunter has devoted his entire life to saving people, to tracking people who are lost in the wilderness, saving people who have no chance to survive if he doesn't find them in time. Mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't even hunt to kill he's hunter is most hunter is a tracker mm -hmm. he's not a killer and he's uh he doesn't like to kill he 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 has killed when he had to but it's he he's not it's not his primary nature to kill and uh his primary nature is to save lives and that's what he's done most of his uh, most of his life. Mm -hmm. uh, so Rambo and Hunter are two very dissimilar uh, type of characters, and, and and you couldn't you couldn't really blend you couldn't really blend them. Okay. Now I know there was an idea with uh, Rambo Five to uh, turn it into a, a sort of a hybrid Hunter Rambo movie, but that's just part of the creative process. Yeah. When when you're when you're uh, developing a movie, you know you've got ten people and everybody throws out you know a ten ideas, and and you know you know out of a hundred ideas you might get one good one, mm -hmm. but and but that's just part of the process. When I write a novel, I'll go through a thousand ideas, and I'm and I might get one idea that works for me. So it's just part of the creative process, you know, that you would, you would go through that kind of thinking. And uh, Stallone, he's got great instincts. And uh, I think he just didn't see it. You know, he didn't, I mean, somebody suggested it, I'm sure. Uh, but, uh, and, and uh, I think Stallone just said, you know, no, because you know, Connor's just not the same uh, kind of, of character as Rambo. They're two, two, the only similarities they share are that they're both very strong and very determined and very smart and, uh, and very skilled mm -hmm. at what they do. And, uh, and uh, they're both wilderness experts, uh, and they can, they can survive in the most desperate of situations. 
mm-hmm. uh, but their motivations are very different. And, and that makes them very different characters because a, mo- a character's motivation uh, is, is everything. Yeah. And uh, so, so no, they, uh, 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 a combo of, of Rambo and Hunter would never work. And uh, I, I think, you know, so I don't blame someone for suggesting the, I, for, for uh, forwarding the idea. That's just, uh, na- that's just part of the you know, creative process. But, uh, you know, I, like I said, when I'm writing a novel, I'll go through a thousand ideas before I settle on one. Yeah. And, you know, that's just that's just part of the creative process of a novel. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I've thrown out 150 pages at a time mm-hmm. when I write a novel. And I'll just, somewhere along the line, I'll realize that somewhere back there, I made the wrong decision. You know, I took a left turn when I should have turned right. Yeah. And I've been fighting along that road since then. And and I'll I'll just have to admit to myself that was a bad decision. Mm-hmm. And I'll go back and I'll every page from that point forward, I'll just pick it up, throw them out the window. Mm-hmm. Whether it's a hundred pages or two hundred pages, I don't care. And I'll start over from that point with with uh, making a different creative decision and uh and i think that's true of uh every everything i mean it's probably you know uh when you're making a movie you you could uh shoot the same scene you know 50 different ways yeah and, and they uh you know maybe three or four of them work but uh People try different things, and some of them work, some of them don't. You know, but you never know. You just give it a try, and uh, uh, so no, no, that you know, the combination would never work. And uh, I knew that when I began the novel. So it's uh, um, I, I I've been asked that question a lot, and. Uh, People who uh, uh, ask me that question are almost always uh, people who um, haven't uh, read the novel or have not given uh, the novel sufficient thought because uh, the characters are so obviously different. Hmm. Okay. Um, Okay, question three here. From Brent, um, have you ever known anyone like Hunter or with Hunter's skills in real life? I've never known his equal. No, I've known people who were great trackers, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, I've never known anyone that could equal uh, the characterization I uh, uh, developed for Hunter. Because he's such a complete and complex character. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hunter is a very unique character. Uh, and, and in fact, I can say I've never read or, uh, uh, se- or seen in a movie any character like Hunter. He is, he is a totally unique and uh, Character, and that's what makes him so fascinating mm-hmm. and uh, sympathetic. And uh, um, so, in real life, no, I've never known anyone that uh, could approach his level of skill. Okay. And I and I and I have and let me add, I have known some great trackers mm-hmm. uh, in my life, but never anyone on that level. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Okay, and, and Brent's last question. Um, how did James come up with the idea for Ghost for Hunter's partner? Well, when I began the novel, I just, you start from scratch. And every, every experience you've ever had in your life, you basically use it when you, when you write. Mm-hmm. 
of uh, everything you've ever felt or known uh, or, or, or lived through or experienced, uh, you use it. You end up using it somehow. And, I, you know, it's, it, was, it wasn't a big thing. I, I, when I was a kid, I had a dog. Uh, you know, and we were real close, and uh, 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 you know, and I thought, wouldn't it be cool if a uh, hunter had a companion? And, uh, and then I came up with the idea of ghost, a, a full-grown wolf who was as much of a friend and a protector uh, as a as a wild uh, creature, because because he's not hunter's pet. Uh, he comes and goes as he wants, uh, and uh, he's uh, he's he's more like uh, Hunter's uh, a bodyguard than than he is anything than he is anything else. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you know that's how that that's how ghosts uh, develop, and uh, and it worked out really well. Uh, the the two of them together work are a very solid team mm -hmm. and uh you know that's uh, one of the strongest parts in my opinion of the novel oh yeah oh yeah definitely and like a couple of those scenes like i know we were talking the other day about uh about that scene where where the agents come to see hunter and and uh ghost is there and they're all nervous about ghost that would be such a great seeing the sea in the movie too because it plays well, on sly's not. you know sly's good points of being able to, to act with not saying anything and showing that amazing animal bond between uh you know hunter and and ghost and i think that would be a great scene for sly because it's such a great human scene and it shows so much respect for you know the animal kingdom and so much love you know, well, that and that came from experience in my real life. When I was a police officer, I answered a call one night to this uh, uh, mansion, basically, and uh, there was this old man, and uh, he was reporting, uh, you know, something strange outside his uh, house, and so oh. uh, me and a couple of guys went out there, and we were standing there. And I was talking to him, and this German Shepherd, I mean, I had never seen a, a dog as that big, <laughs> ferocious looking in my life. It came up behind me, and it just stood there, slightly to my right, right side, with its head just barely lowered. And I can just feel that if I made one wrong move, that thing would kill me in seconds. Even wow. if, I mean, I, I wouldn't even have a chance to get a shot off. I mean, it, it didn't move. It didn't even move. It just stood there mm -hmm. and didn't make it. Didn't make a sound. And with its head just slightly lowered, you know. And and and, and then uh, the man, old man, you know, snapped his fingers and it walked through us. And you know, on into the house, and I could just, you could just feel the power. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, and uh, for a creature who never made a sound and never moved, it was astonishingly frightening. Mm -hmm. And I was carrying a gun, you know, but I just knew that if I made one wrong move with this old man. That this thing, I would be dead before I hit the ground. Wow, I can definitely relate to that. We, um, I used to live with my cousin, and we had a, uh, we lived in this little community, kind of like uh, not gay community, but like its own community, and um, there was this elderly couple. I think the guy was a retired hunter or something like that, and he had, um, he had three Dobermans. And he would let them run around in the back all the time, like near the train tracks and all that, I guess, to, to give the dog some exercise. And that path was actually one of the paths to the nearest store. So one time I, was, I went to his store 
uh, to pick up some some beer for a party, and I was on my way back, and I saw them way at the other end, like way way at the other end. It must have been like, like it was like, like full I don't know three or four or five blocks away, and the dogs got away from them and they ran and they were coming at me, three Dobermans, and I was watching them coming. I was like, oh my gosh, here we go, and they like literally came right up to me. And just stood there and stared at me. And you could feel that. You could feel that fear. You know like. They were like low growling. And like they were just staring me down. And so I was trying not to look at them. I was trying to like just hold on to what I was holding. I still had a case of beer in my hand. So I was trying to hold on. And I could hear the people. From way down. Saying you know. Don't move your arms. Don't. Don't yell at them. Don't do anything. We're on the way, you know. And I had to wait like that for like, like five, five or six minutes, until they caught up to get the dogs to come back to them. And it was the most that six, like five or six minutes. It must have felt. It felt like hours. I was so terrified. Well, that when that thing came up behind me and stood there, and it, it didn't come in front of me. It stood behind me. Mm-hmm slightly to my side and uh, it didn't make a sound it didn't move and it, it didn't do anything threatening but you could just feel the power of it you yeah. could feel it was something primordial Whew. that your in, your instincts tell you yeah D- don't move yeah whatever you do don't move yeah and, uh, and uh, it's like the fight or flight kicks in you know it's like yeah, I would have never, although I had a gun on my side, I don't think I would have even been able to clear leather mm-hmm. before that thing, you know, killed me. You know, and you could, although it made no threatening movement, you could just feel it and uh, uh, in the air. Yeah. And, and I, I incorporated that into Hunter because uh I wanted to I wanted his companion to have that kind of presence mm. uh, which is uh electrifying I mean it's uh it's galvanizing it's uh it's terrifying yeah and and, and they don't have to do anything threatening to uh to, for you to know yeah that, you know you better not move you better not do anything wrong. Mm-hmm. Or this thing will tear you to pieces Oof. before it can hit the ground. Dang. And uh, I put that in. I put that in uh, uh, the novel, and uh, it's it's one of the most powerful scenes in the novel. Yeah, it's, it's one of my favorites. That and the I, the bear autopsy with the knife scene. Those are those are just wow. I, I I love those. Those are intriguing. And the intro too is very intriguing. But I won't give anything away. People should really read that. Yeah, let's not give away any spoilers. <laughs> so, thank you, Brent, for your questions. I know, like like I was saying before, Brent's a really huge admirer of your work. I think he has uh, pretty much everything you've released, and he's really like um, he was he was one of the ones who was responsible for turning me on uh, to what you do, like to a lot of what you do. So, uh, thank you again, Brent. Okay, our next question comes from another great friend of ours, Ryan Rebalkin, who does the Rocky Going the Distance podcast uh, with his brother, Ruben Rebalkin. Awesome guys. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, so everyone out there should go check them out. You'll have a good time over there. Uh, and he writes, um, for the 2009 version, why do you think it didn't get made? as a, a Rambo film, you know, for like 20 years ago, you know? And do you think it works better as a standalone? Well, to answer the second part first, uh, yes, it works better as a standalone, and I don't see any other way that it could be done mm-hmm. other than as a standalone. And the reason why it didn't get made, I mean, there there could be a hundred reasons. Uh, funding, uh uh, studio uh, disagreements, uh, script disagreements, uh, 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 and and Sylvester Stallone has projects lined up for, for you know ten years at a time. I mean he you know 
he, he had to try to work it into his schedule. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, uh, he's, he's, he's probably got projects lined up now. He's probably got his next seven or eight movies already lined up. Yeah. So, uh, you know, he's, he's got to work it into his schedule. And, um, uh, you know, so. He must you know, get like 100 phone calls a day easy. You know? Oh, yeah. So, you know, there, there could be a, a hundred different reasons for why he hasn't been able to make it up, up to this point. And, uh, uh, you know, and uh, it's like any actor, any famous uh, actor has got probably five films uh, at any one time lined up. Mm -hmm. You know, the, they, the, uh, uh, they they don't just sit around waiting uh, for an offer. They're trying to get this project done so they can move to the next project they already signed for. And uh, so there's there's constant scheduling problems okay. with a with a major motion picture, yeah. you know, and a major actor because uh, they're they're uh, always busy. And they're always committed to one project, and then another project, yeah, and then another project, you know. And so they have to find the right place in their schedule to do uh, um, uh, anything. Yeah, it, you know, especially with all those moving parts and everything, like all the different people who have to work on. Or like John Landis said it great when he said, uh, you know, he's got to tip his hat to anyone who can even get a movie made. Because they're so hard to get made. Yeah, Especially somebody now. in the business told me, he said, it's a miracle to me that any movie ever gets made. Yeah. He said, because just to line up everybody's schedule at the same time, yeah. it, it takes a, a, an act of God. You know, I mean, you've got seven actors, and all seven of them are committed to three or four different projects, yeah. and you get them all the same place at the same time, on the same project, and you know that just you could go you could go ten years yeah. trying to trying to accomplish that. Yeah. So, and then you've got to get the right funding. You've got to get the right studio. Um, you've got to get the right screenplay. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there's so like you said, there's so many moving parts, and uh, to get them all together at the same time is a very difficult uh, act. Definitely, definitely agree with you on that one. That's uh, wow, and, and you know you hear you hear all these stories like that book uh, Tales from Development Heck or Hell or something like that, where there's all these amazing movies that were worked on and money went to them, but they never they never got made, and you know people spent millions on these, and you know amazing, just amazing. Uh, when That's you start digging, like when you start That's digging. You can. There's so much to learn there. Yeah, I, I think that happens a lot. I mean, oh, um, yeah. there are a lot of, of great movies that are halfway made. Yeah. There were scheduling problems, or somebody broke their leg, you know, or, or you know, uh, the director quit, or uh, the funding fell out, or uh, uh, the, the, they they had a major dispute with the studio or the distributor. Or, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, it just goes on. You could just go on all day. <laughs> yeah. Problems you could run into that could stop you from making a movie. When you've got nine out of ten things uh, lined up, but that one thing prevents you from making it, you know. Yep. Oh, oh boy. Movie magic. Movie magic. All right, let's move on to our next question. And thank you, Ryan, for your question. Our next question is from another great friend of the show, Mr. Jeffrey Kupsta. And he asks, what makes this passion project stand out from the rest of your typical run-of-the-mill sci-fi creature feature? And how will it be relevant to today as opposed to when it was written? I don't think it would be any different today than when it was written. Uh... And what, but what makes it unique is 
the, the character of Hunter himself is so unique. Yeah, it does uh, have a timeless feel to it too. Yeah, and uh, the 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 character of the creature is uh, extraordinarily uh, unique. Uh, not, I, I I can't think of any movie, like I said, or any book that's ever captured a creature like this. And uh, so uh, it stands alone in the sci-fi genre and the, the fantasy genre and the thriller genre, uh, the horror genre, whatever genre you want to put it in. Uh, it, it's uh, because they're both Hunter and the creature are so unique in themselves that I think that's the most powerful aspect of the movie. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, you know, I think I don't think it would be any different uh, now than it would have been when it, the day after I finished writing. Uh, you know, it's just uh, um, getting it done. That's all. Yeah. And he goes on to say, to ask, uh, how will it appeal and be a hit, do you think? Um, oh, I think the audience for it will be immense. Uh, because everybody can relate to being outmatched by something that should be feared. Yeah. And uh, it's, not a, it's not an extraordinary concept. It's a it's a it's a it's a something that everyone instinctively knows and understands and they can relate to hunter mm -hmm. his uh, his uh his this uh catastrophic situation that he's caught in mm -hmm. and uh so uh i think the appeal would be universal yeah and there's a great appeal of like good versus evil evil man against the element Man against beast, science against the earth, you know, or, or against Mother Nature. There's so much in there. Um, well, it's, it's more than nature that, he's, that Hunter faces more. The, the enemy is, is more than just natural. Yeah. Uh, it's something darker than nature. And... Uh, there, I think people will relate to that too, uh, um, just by instinctively, they, they'll relate to it, um, and and understand and and understand it. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you think Sly uh, will still be up front in the face of it, uh, or more like in the background, like background capacity, working on it? Oh no! I think he'll uh, he'll be up front. Yeah. Um, I think this is a uh, project that I cannot speak for Sly, uh, but um, I think uh, this project is close to his heart, and he'll he'll be up front with it. Ooh. He'll be he'll be prom he'll he'll be a prominent part of the movie. I don't think he'll be a back background. He can't be a background character because. The, the whole novel centers around the conflict between Hunter and the creature mm -hmm. and uh, certain elements that play into it that uh, that belong only to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, Stallone will have to uh, uh, be just as prominent as the creature. It will be it will be fifty fifty. Okay. Do you think like um, also uh, also I guess he means what he means by that too is um, do you think he'll be working like in the direction of the film or producing or all that other stuff as well or do you think he'll leave that to other people? I don't know what he's thinking. I don't know what he's planning. Um, he might be planning to direct. Uh, he might not. Uh, I, yeah, it's very I, I, early. I can't. I can't speak for him on that. Okay. Um, he would have to answer that question himself. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, Jeff's final question here, which is, I know, something we've talked about a couple of times between us. Uh, 
do you think Mickey Rourke will still be eligible for the Homo Scimitar creature rule? The Homo Therium, the creature, uh, Homo Scimitar is a saber-toothed tiger. Mm -hmm. uh, this thing is not a saber-toothed tiger. Uh, the DNA of it doesn't come from a saber-toothed tiger. It's a different creature. Okay. Uh, and and uh, uh, as far as the casting of the creature, I really can't speak to that. I think uh, Mickey Rourke is a fantastic actor. I think he's one of the greatest actors uh, in the business. And if he wanted to, if, if Mickey Rourke wanted to, uh, I'm... He could. I, I can't think of anyone doing a more powerful job than he could do in the capturing uh, the the, uh, the purity of uh, the creature. Uh, but uh, you know, I don't. I don't have anything to do with those decisions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it would be cool too because they have such a great chemistry, Sly and Rourke. Like if you watch. Uh, if you watch how they are in in the Expendables, that that scene where Mickey Rourke breaks down, that's such a great, 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 great vulnerable scene for both of them. And then if you cut to like, uh, say watching him in in uh, Sly and um, Get Carter, you know how they're both at that peak at the end, where you know it's like Sly is pretty much losing his mind, and and he knows that 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 fate's inevitable, that they're gonna have to clash. And the way they play off each other is, is just brilliant. And it, well, I, the thing that Sylvester Stallone and Mickey Rourke have in common is the level of their craftsmanship. They both don't appear to be acting. When, when they fulfill a role, they embody the, the, the character. It's like they disappear within yeah. the character. Yeah, and uh, and they're just that powerful. Each of them are that powerful as an actor, and uh, to set them against each other, and Hunter really, to my in in my opinion, would be uh, an awesomely powerful uh, 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 conflict. Yeah, uh, you know, just on every level. Yeah, his. Mickey Rourke brings so much ama so many amazing things to the table that a lot of people I, I find don't really see. He did that movie Spun, where him and Jason Schwartzman, which is the son of Talia Shire, are uh, driving back to this trailer, and he's telling he's he's telling this uh, he's like the really tough guy throughout the whole movie, but he's he's giving this monologue and he's talking about what damaged him as a child to make him what he is now, and the other guy's just passed out, you know. So it's kind of like he knows that that guy, you know, is not listening to him. But like, it's the first time he can actually get close enough to someone to tell them to let them in. You know? Yeah. Well, you know, you could say the same thing about Stallone. I mean. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, just think about uh, the franchises Stallone has created. I mean, he embodied. He embodies the character of Rocky when he plays Rocky. Yeah. And when he plays Rambo, he embodies an entirely different kind of character. Yeah. Uh, to the point of uh, perfection. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, and so he he, uh, he 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 just becomes what he uh, uh, aims to become. Yeah. And uh, the same thing can be said of Mickey Rourke, and the same thing can be said of some other actors. Uh, but they're all uh, at the peak of their craft. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're both equally powerful. Uh, and uh, Yeah. I love how Sly can re reimagine himself for every role. Like, you never, you never watch, like, a, a different Sly movie... And think that it feels the same as another slime movie. They always feel different. Even even some of the ones that are their own franchises feel different too. He's amazing eye, and he has, you know, I I heard Richard Crenna say this about him that he he knows how, he's one of those few actors who know how to act towards the camera, and 
He's just got this really great ability with his eyes and this really great ability uh, with his movement. I mean, his writing is so, it's amazing. Like, it's amazing um, if people get the chance to read some of Sly stuff, like some of his books or Sly, novelizations. Sly, Sly is an amazingly skilled uh, screenwriter yeah. himself. And, uh, but to, to emphasize how, how skilled he is, I mean, no, you, you, nobody can imagine the character of Rocky yeah. in First Blood. Exactly. You know, Everyone you know, was afraid of that. They're just so such different uh, characters, and yet uh, Sylvester Stallone created a franchise out of each character that which are t just polar opposites of each other. Yeah. And and Hunter is yet a different character than than, than Rambo or Rocky. And if he wants to create a franchise out of Hunter, he'll be able to do it because he, he can just embody the role. And, uh, I, you know, it's just an amazing thing for me to, uh, to watch mm -hmm. and to, uh, you know, see him do it. Yeah, uh, it's phenomenal, phenomenal. Um, I was going to say about, yeah, in closing, too, I think a, lo a lot of people – um, it would make sense also to to bring Mickey Rourke in because uh, I find like his role in I think it was Iron Man two was kind of kind of similar in the way of uh, of science and all that too. So I think that would be a, a really cool way to to bring him back. I think a lot of people would like that because you know Iron Iron Man two was a big success and he he was he was phenomenal phenomenal in that also. So well, he played the role of Whiplash in um, yeah. Iron Man two. And uh, just the opening scenes where he was uh, creating his weapon was, uh, to me, an instant classic. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and, uh, and the bird but and everything. What was so powerful about it is he never said a single word. <coughs> yeah. Uh, in the whole thing. Uh, except, you know, he said a few words to his father as his father died. And after that, you know, it goes for five minutes or longer where he's creating his weapons and the way, just the way he did it, the, the, you can just feel the lethality, the, the, yeah. the, uh, the, the anger, the power, the rage mm -hmm. in the, in the, the slightest, tiniest movement that he made and it communicated to you that something he, he was going. He's very dangerous, and he's going to do something very dangerous. Yeah. And uh, uh, and uh, I was amazed at that scene. Uh, and uh, you know, so you know, I I can't say enough good things about Mickey Rourke. I mean, I I think he's the most. Uh, there is no one better. Uh, yeah, there is. Than, there's there's uh, only one, right? There's only one Mickey Rourke. Yeah, I mean, there are other actors who are uh, equally as uh, powerful. I mean, uh, Stallone himself is uh, equally as powerful as uh, any any actor in the business, uh, and and far more than uh, you know ninety nine percent of. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, you know, to the casting for Hunter will be done by you know people who. Uh, Use a criteria that I, I I'm not even aware of, and uh, and uh, of course you know everything would depend on uh, uh, the, the people themselves whether they're uh, want to do the project or not whether their hearts in the project or uh, um, uh, whether they even understand it. I, I'm sometimes amazed at great actors who just don't get don't understand a role uh, like uh, Sean Connery. He was offered the role of Gandalf in the, you know, uh, the trilogy, uh, and uh, he said he read the book. He read the book again, and then he read it again, and uh, he said he still didn't get it. Mm -hmm. and so he turned down the role, you know. And uh, and I thought, how can you not get the role of Gandalf? Yeah. You know. You know. But uh, you know, he just he said he, 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 
he just yeah. didn't get it. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, you know, he turned down the role. And, uh, uh, but the history is filled with uh, actors who turned down roles that I cannot, I just cannot conceive of how they turned down certain roles. I mean, James Conn was offered the uh, role of Willard in uh, Apocalypse Now. Mm-hmm. He turned that down. And, uh, you know, to the, and I, I don't, I just, I, I cannot comprehend why, you know, and uh, because it was such a great role and uh, uh, such a great story and uh, a great movie, uh, you know, so, uh, but, you know, the history of uh, movie making is just replete, replete with actors who turned down roles and ended up winning other actors an Academy Award. Mm-hmm. I think, um, um, I could go on all day about that, but, you know, it's just, uh, I feel it'll, you. It will probably depend on a lot of factors. It will depend on people's schedules. It will depend on how much they want for the role, how much they want to be paid. Yeah. Uh, you know, it'll depend. It'll depend on whether the studio agrees. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot. Like you said, I mean, there's so many moving parts. You know, you just, the, you just, But hopefully, they'll find the right person for the right role, mm-hmm. and uh, it will work. It would be. It would be. In my, in my opinion, one of the greatest Hollywood rematches of all time. Oh, I think it would be a classic. I, I think uh, Hunter is going to be uh, a classic. I think it will become a cult classic mm-hmm. once finished. Awesome. Yeah, it's gonna be. It's gonna be something, man. It's gonna be. Woo! I can't wait. All right, let's move on to our next question. And this one comes from our good friend DJ David James Donnelly. Um, his question would be, <clears throat> excuse me, um, if Stallone or a movie company does make Hunter and it is successful, would you make a sequel, follow-up novel to uh, the original, uh, just like Irvin Walsh did for transporting, transporting? Well, I would be more than willing to write a sequel to... Uh... Hunter, uh, you know, every, every book, uh, it would be difficult, but every book has its own unique challenges. Like probably the most difficult novel I've ever written was my last novel, Dark Vision, mm-hmm. which is, which has just been recently released because it involves an old detective and he's blind and he mm-hmm. goes up against this underworld force. And his uh, companion is a raven, which, uh, uh, and there, it was so difficult to write because he's blind. And, and, and you have to write everything from the perspective of someone, of, of a, a retired ex-homicide detective solving this horrendous homicide without his eyesight. Mm-hmm. So in order to prepare for the role for for writing Dark Visions, I I wore a blindfold for about three months. Wow! Just learning how to function with my other senses. Uh, uh, and uh, it was a, a tremendous learning experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, echolocation is something that uh, bats do. And you know, you're, you know, you they uh, make the sound and the sound return to them and lets them know where something's at. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I tried to develop that myself, and and uh, so I wouldn't be bumping into walls and falling down the stairs and whatever. And and uh, and I learned how to do everything. Everything in that three month period to me became um, uh, uh, numbers. Okay. 
I knew exactly how many steps to take in this direction to avoid this. I knew how many steps and to reach everything and to go everywhere I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. Everything to me was measured. Uh, um, you know, um, you know, some people, you know, they look out there and the park is right there and they see that the park is about 150 feet away. Mm -hmm. But uh, to me, to get to a certain place in the park, it wasn't 150, it wasn't 150 feet away, it was uh, 87 steps, exactly. And I learned to do everything like that. Wow. And uh, I learned how to uh, pour a glass of, uh, just how to, learning how to pour a glass of water, learning how to eat, uh, learning how to uh, 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 do anything, really, without your eyesight is a, was a, a, one of the most, the greatest learning experiences of my life. And uh, I learned to develop my other senses to compensate for my lack of eyesight. And uh, I incorporated all that into dark visions. Wow. And so dark visions is really one of the most difficult projects I've ever uh, attempted. Wow. And, you know, it's a, uh, and I think it's a fascinating, fascinating book to read. It's, ama it's I, amazing, too, that to put in the I work, think, that kind of work for it would, wow. It gives you a whole different respect for that, for not just writing it, but reading it and, and, and having to go through uh, training yourself, like retraining yourself. Yeah, I do that for every novel I write. Uh, but Dark Visions was particularly difficult because I didn't have my eyesight. And I never realized how much you depend on your eyesight until I uh, tried to walk around for three months without my eyesight, mm -hmm. uh, without you know, with a black wearing a blindfold. Yeah, when I was when I when when I was a kid, me and well, my sisters, and my brother-in-laws, but me, and my 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 uh, my best friend Cornell. And our friends Christina and Tyla, we went to this. Um, it was like a huge indoor uh, thing where they where it simulated being blind. Like you go in, you go in and you walk through this pretty much like a maze. But you everything inside sounds like it's outside, but you can't see anything. And it takes like maybe half an hour to an hour to get through it or something like that. But um. That was a really cool learning experience for me because I got to experience some of, you know, what blind people must have to, uh, what blind people live with. Yeah, the first week I, I walked around with a blindfold on, uh, getting used to it, I, I, I was bumping into things, I was bumping into the wall, I couldn't find the door, uh, I couldn't go down the stairs very easily because I uh, couldn't see the steps Ooh. and and but with each week that passed my uh, I just changed as a person I mean I, all my senses changed uh, my hearing uh, my sense of feel and uh, uh, the uh, your uh, uh, your awareness of things that you're not normally aware of that you can hear and most people hear but they don't rec know that they're uh, hearing them mm -hmm. because they're busy with their uh, looking at something yeah and and, when, yeah. When, and somewhere around the second month of walking around in a blindfold I really began to hear so much and to become aware of so much, I could tell you whether the window was open half an inch, mm -hmm. uh, and not even looking at it, I could just, I, I could just feel it, and I, and, or I could tell you when uh, somebody stepped on the porch, you know, which was uh, would be about 200 feet away from where I, I usually am, and uh, I could just, I would know, you know, I would be aware of it. 
uh, and uh, uh, that awareness is what I wrote into the character of Joe Mack when he attempts to solve this unsolvable murder. And uh, and, and and with the, it's a, it's a, it's a fast dark visions is, is a fascinating detective story because I don't think any detective story's ever been written like it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's, that's even close to it because uh, it's just totally it's a totally unique uh, uh, detective story awesome <coughs> sorry people I just have to bear with me I got a little bit of a cold still um, our next question comes from another good friend Mr. Sego here saying um, a little bit uh, of, uh, we touched on this before, but, um, you know, did you envision Stallone as Hunter or will it require extensive reimagining for that to happen? I didn't only envision uh, Stallone for the role of Hunter. I envisioned Stallone for the role of uh, Joe Mack in Dark Vision. Mm-hmm. Because I think that uh, uh, the, I, so for some reason, I just wrote Dark Visions with Stallone in mind. Mm -hmm. He just fit the character so perfectly. Uh, his stoicism, his uh, strength, his, uh, his, uh, the conciseness of his uh, speech, uh, his... Uh, he can be eloquent with very few words. Mm -hmm. And that's one of Joe Mack's strongest qualities. And so when I wrote Dark Vision, I wrote it with uh, Stallone in mind. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, you know, I really wrote both novels based on Stallone's uh, persona. Okay. And... Uh, that's how they came to be. All right. Well, thank you, Seiko, for your question. And thank you for answering that one. Uh, we're going to go on to the next one. All right, moving on to our next question. Um, asked from one of my best friends uh, in the podcasting community, a guy I love to work with all the time, uh, just a, another amazing wealth of knowledge, really great Oh, just a really great podcast, a really great friend, really works hard, a big admirer of your work too, um, Mr. John Wichard, a.k.a. Zero Cool 1389. Um, okay. His question is, uh, I know Stallone is leading Hunter, but if for some reason Stallone wasn't able to play the lead character, is there anybody out there who could take on that role? And he adds, uh, haven't read the novel so i'm thinking basic here he hasn't did he did you say he hasn't read the novel he hasn't he read has, he hasn't read the the novel the whole way through yet so. well i personally cannot imagine anyone but stallone playing hunter uh it would uh it's just uh my imagination fails me um but i'm sure that uh Stallone himself could uh, pick the right character to replace him in the role if he, for some reason, is unable to uh, do it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what the, that's uh, I just can't think of anyone else that would that would uh, uh, really fulfill and uh, would uh, truly embody the character of Hunter. But uh, Sylvester Stallone. Yeah, because there's a lot of qualities there that Sly has, you know, and that's it's really hard shoes to fill if you're gonna try, you know. Like there's only there's only one Sly, and there's only one. It feel you know there's it, there's like only one Hunter in the same way, you know. Yeah, they're both very unique characters and. And since I created Hunter based on Sly's very unique uh, uh, qualities, mm -hmm. uh, I don't I can't think of another actor who possesses the same qualities uh, 
or even uh, close to uh, quality that are uh, equal yeah. to uh, Sloan uh, uh, faculties. And uh, so uh, it's hard for me to imagine anybody else in the role. Okay. Well, thank you, John, for your question. Um, all right. Once again, he big fan of yours. Uh, we talked about we we talked about Hunter a, a lot in the past. You know, we've done a lot of uh, Hunter talks and you know trying to think of what could have been and you know those alternate universe scenarios. Um, all right. So now we're gonna go on to our questions from Michael Sparks. All right, and Michael Sparks asks. He says, sadly, have not read your book yet, sir, but I know and love the story and idea of making it into a film. How would you like to see the film made? A big budget CGI action film or just a low key film with not so many special effects or maybe practical effects driven? Well, um, and to answer that question simply, I don't even understand CGI very well. And I don't know what would be the best way to do it. Uh, that's a question that would be best answered by the Stallone himself or the producers. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a technical question. And uh, frankly, I have very little technical knowledge of uh, how movies are made. Uh, you know, uh, so uh, my best guess would be uh, maybe a combination of the two. I, I, you know, it's just a that, that's just a wild speculation mm -hmm. on my part. Mm -hmm. So I can't really answer that question very well. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, well, thank you, Michael Sparks, for your question, and thank you, John, for your question. And uh, we'll move on to the next question. And for our next question, uh, we have another great friend. All, all, everyone on the show today is a really great friend who's asking questions. But Mr. Bud Marizzi, who uh, who is a aspiring stand-up comic and does a lot of like Stallone comedy, which uh, you don't see that a lot. You know, I think the last person you really see that who did it right was was maybe Eddie Murphy. You know, but uh, you know, Bud has a great talent for that. So he asks, "What are your thoughts about Sly?" making hunter well i think that uh it would be a cult classic i think it would be like unlike not only unlike anything sly's ever done before but unlike anything anyone has done before and uh i think that uh it would be a, a movie that would just become more and more popular with time Mm -hmm. And it would gain a, a, a following, a, a cult following that would uh, endure for uh, uh, as far as I can see. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's that, I think the, the subject matter and the characters are so original and, and so unique and so powerful that the movie would take on a life of its own mm -hmm. and uh, become something very powerful um, that would last but, uh, with great popularity for uh, quite some time, if not permanently. Mm -hmm. I, I think also, like, under Stallone's direction, too, like, he's got a great, a great way of immortalizing film, you know? Well, Stallone is a great director. Uh, I mean, he, there are a few actors who are also great directors. Uh, Stallone's one of them. Uh, there's Clint Eastwood. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mel Gibson. Mm -hmm. he, Mel Gibson's an know, amazing director. And uh, Stallone is a, uh, he's a he's a very powerful actor, but he's also a very visual visually gifted uh, director. And uh, he, it's and when if he does direct Hunter, I think it would just be uh, just totally amazing uh, production. 
Yeah, I would I would love to see him direct it. I would love to see him maybe write the script, or I'd love to see you write the script too. Well, they haven't asked me uh, yet to uh, write the uh, screenplay for Hunter, mm -hmm. uh, but if they did, I would uh, uh, I hope and I I think that I would be capable of of, of producing uh, a sterling screenplay for it. Uh, Noveling and screenwriting are two entirely different arts. Yeah. You have to uh, think in, in entirely different ways when you write a novel and when you write a screenplay. Mm -hmm. uh, it, like I said, it's two arts, two different kinds of writing. And, uh, and there's not a lot of novelists who can also do a screenplay because it's such a different uh, art form. But uh, I think I could, I think I could fulfill uh, uh, the, um, the job. I think I could do the job uh, in such a way that uh, uh, everyone would be uh, very happy with uh, the, the uh, end product. And uh, for also writing is rewriting. Yeah. I mean, write a screenplay, uh, and even when they're in production, you're rewriting almost every day. Yeah. Uh, you know, you uh, what you have planned for, for the next day, someone comes up with an idea to change it, to make it better, and you have to rewrite it overnight. Yeah. So it's like you're constantly rewriting uh, until it's finished and, 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 and it never ends. And it's, uh, it's like a book in a way of uh, a book seems to just go on forever and ever and ever. I rewrote the first chapter of Hunter over 200 times before I was satisfied with it. Hmm. And, uh, when you're writing a screenplay, if I did get the job to write the screenplay, I would expect I would have to be rewriting the screenplay virtually every day of filming because every actor is going to have contributions to their uh, role yeah. and the creativity of uh, how, how they want to portray the character and what they want the character to say. And so you, you have to be, be adapting all the time. And uh, uh, so you don't just write a screenplay and give it to the company yeah. and they just run off with it and do the movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to be available 24 hours a day during the whole production to rewrite every single day because you never know what somebody's going to come up with that you're going to have to uh, change and uh, in the screenplay and incorporate an entire new approach or an, an entire new uh, line of dialogue. Uh, so it's a never-ending uh, process as long as the production uh, continues. Okay. And I, I would do that with Dark Visions. Uh, if they asked me to do the script and play for Dark Visions, or I would do it for Hunter, if they asked me to do it for Hunter. So, you know, I understand the job, and I understand the art form. Uh, I've studied screenplays equally as uh, much as I've studied uh, novels. And uh, I understand the how to switch hats. Yeah, yeah. And it's a... Uh, it's, uh, um, I cannot hardly emphasize enough the difference in uh, styles, yeah. and you know it's uh, it's it take decades to uh, to understand it, really. And I I've, I've spent you know thirty years studying it you know constantly, so I have a pretty good understanding of what would be required of, of me if they asked me to do the screenplay. Okay. This this is usually 
in the podcast where I ask, you know, what some things might have been that were supposed to go into the book that never went into the book. But I think I'll save that for another day. Um, All right. Because that, that sounds like it could be a podcast in all itself. Um, all right, so we'll go on to our final question. And I just want to thank everyone uh, everyone who submitted questions again for submitting them. And I want to thank you for answering them. Um, so we'll, we'll get on to our last questions of the night. And thank you once again, Mr. Bud Marisi, for your question. Now... Uh, to finish it off, we have uh, one another one of my my best friends up here, everyone's favorite cyber extraterrestrial, Mister Wildman Beyond Isaiah Deshane Harrison, uh, wonderful guy, um, a lot of insight on on uh, different films and stuff, a, a great lover of film and uh, music and and uh, pop culture in 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 general. Uh, he writes in I think three questions here, and the first one is. Um, Oh, why do you think they didn't make it make Hunter Rambo 5 or saved for a Rambo 6? Because Hunter and Rambo are such different different characters. Mm -hmm. Hunter is not Rambo, although they share certain similarities uh, in physical strength and endurance and uh, uh, wilderness skills and the will, the sheer will to survive no matter what. They do share those similarities, but their motivations are radically different. And so that makes them radically different characters. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they, you know, you couldn't combine the two of them in the same you know, in the same character. Okay. Um tagging on to that, do you think that Hunter is gonna take any uh cues from Rambo? I'm not. I'm not sure if he means from the 2009 version or just in regular, in uh, general. I don't know uh, any cue from Rambo. Yeah. Um, uh, other than other than the 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 fact that they both uh, have similar uh, physical and uh, intellectual uh, skills. Um, uh, no, I don't. I don't see the uh, the identification of the two characters. Um, uh, Hunter, Hunter, if Hunter is actually far more skilled than uh, the character of uh, Rambo when it comes to uh, tracking or uh, wilderness survival, because that's all he does. Mm -hmm. Rambo is a soldier, and uh, but and Hunter is virtually uh, a, a part of uh, nature himself. Yeah, uh, he he is uh, he has an understanding and a oneness with nature that makes him uh, that's what makes him so good at what he does, mm -hmm. and uh, so. Uh, you know, he might take some cues from uh, Rambo, and you know, in the area of uh, of, uh, of, of how he uh, uh, engages in combat. Uh, but those would be similarities that would be common to virtually anyone who is skilled in combat. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, um, when you reach a certain plateau in fighting skills it it all equals out I yeah mean, it's it's almost like everybody uses the same style mm -hmm. you know, um, um, if, if there is no style you know so uh, there, you know there, there would be similarities sure but uh, not not in the terms of uh, motivation and uh, not in terms of uh, of uh, knowledge uh hunter is, is far more knowledgeable than the character of rambo when it comes to uh wilderness survival and tracking mm -hmm. hunting um uh like 
I'll say, and Rambo is far superior to the character of Hunter when it comes to uh, fighting, mm -hmm. when it comes to overcoming, you know, insurmountable of uh, 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 opponents. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in in mm -hmm. the novel Hunter, in the storyline Hunter, he goes up against something that is primordial. Yeah. That only a great hunter could challenge and survive. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so, you know, there's similarities and there's dissimilarities between two characters. I, I know, like, I, I remember, like, if say if the old version was made, the 2009 Rambo version, I know one scene I really, really love to see is the is when Hunter performs the autopsy on the bear with the knife. Yeah. That scene is phenomenal. And like the scene before it where the creature is stalking them, watching them sleep all night long. And it shows you how, just how good the creature is at doing what it does to get that bear in there and not well, I, have anyone notice it. I won't um, explain why the creature is as intelligent and cunning as it is because it would spoil the novel for people who haven't read it. Okay. You know? Yeah, and yeah, the, definitely. But the creature is just as intelligent and just as cunning as any man and far more intelligent than most. Mm -hmm. and, and it also has a will to survive that is matched only by a uh, hunter. And uh, uh, so, um, uh, yeah, the creature is uh, the creature is phenomenally intelligent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, oh yeah, definitely, definitely, um, way up there on the spectrum. And I think maybe Hughes, I would have liked to see, maybe would be maybe to bring Ted Kotcheff back. Ted Kotcheff to, and Sly because they, they worked so well together in the past. Or maybe one dream thing I would love to see for Hunter that sadly is impossible now is to had to would have had maybe Jerry Goldsmith do the score for Hunter. That it feels like when you're reading it, you kind of feel like it feels like it, it feels like you know Jerry Goldsmith's score in the background in your head, you know. Yeah, I mean, music and the score in a movie is uh, so important. Mm -hmm. Have you ever sat down and just watched a movie without sound? Oh uh, yeah, say? yeah. And it, you and it's just amazingly dull. <laughs> you know? And 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 but and then you add the right score, and all of a sudden it it just becomes a, a phenomenon. So uh, the right score is critical. The right the, uh, is, uh, you know, to uh, any movie. And, uh, you know, Hunter uh, or Dark Visions would be no different. Yeah. Uh, and Dark Visions, it would be amazing to have an ambient score. And like, you know, like some of those uh, Japanese composers who make scores out of natural sound, you know, natural everyday sounds. That... That could be interesting too, like three D binaural sound. Yeah, it, it would be and because at at about two months of wearing that blindfold, I began to identify sounds that I had been aware of all my life, mm -hmm. but I wasn't truly hearing them. I wasn't. I didn't know. I didn't know they were there. Mm -hmm. And uh, but you know, you develop. I developed other senses too when I was writing Dark Visions. I mean, somewhere around the third month, uh, I could tell you, I could just reach out with my hand, with my palm, you know, facing up, and I could tell you whether it was cloudy or not. Because yeah. I had developed a feel for sunlight, and I could tell you whether, you know, how bright the sun was whether it was cloudy or whether rain was coming because my, my, you know, you just, your, your other, 
we, we all have these senses, but we don't use them because yeah. we're not aware of them. Yeah, and over time with technology and everything, we're kind of dumbed down. It's not like the old, the olden times where we had to use our senses. Now it's kind of like, you know, everything's so industrial and we're so closed off. You know, we well, spend our time looking at our phones. We don't even, we walk down the street looking at our phones. We don't even look up anymore. Right. Well, a lot of the senses that I incorporated in Dark Visions with Joe Mack, the lead character, mm -hmm. Hunter uses those same senses because yeah. he himself is like a, uh, a human. Uh, he's like a, a big cat himself. Yeah. You know, and he has the instincts. He has, his instincts have been so sharpened by his life in the wilderness mm -hmm. that uh, he has the same instinct. He has the same awareness, uh, uh, almost supernatural awareness that uh, uh, Joe, Joe Mack has. Or you know you could might maybe stretch the uh, uh, analogy uh, of, of a tiger or a, a, you know um, and that's another thing that makes the creature in Hunter so dangerous is it's got the cunning and the intelligence mm -hmm. and the will to survive of, of the fiercest darkest human being yet it has the uh, preternatural instincts of a tiger. So the combination of those two qualities make it uh, really the most uh, dangerous creature that I personally have ever seen in a book or a movie. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Um... And the last question here, uh, the last question we have from Mr. Isaiah is, uh, do you think, in a way, Hunter would be like Stallone's Predator? I don't know if he means that like as a sci-fi alien flick or just as, you know, like a way to bring Stallone into the sci-fi genre, but I, I don't really look at it as sci-fi. Well, you can't compare... <coughs> Sorry. You can't compare Hunter to Predator because because there's nothing in Hunter that resembles Predator. Uh, they're just two entirely different concepts. Hunter is a very original concept, and uh, uh, the there's just nothing in Hunter that uh, resembles Predator. I mean, people that make that comparison are people that uh, just simply haven't read Hunter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your questions, Isaiah. And thank you once again for answering that. Um, all right. And now we have some bonus questions uh, for the second half of the show. And our first bonus question is, what brought you to the story of Hunter in the first place? Well, I grew up in the Sipsy Wilderness in North Alabama, largely, and in South Carolina, and I, I, I spent most of my young life in the wilderness. And uh, I've always been fascinated with, with tracking. Mm -hmm. And uh, with uh, uh, I've learned at an early age that nothing moves in the wild without leaving a sign. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was fascinated with uh, tracking since, since a very young age like six or seven years old, I began teaching myself because there was no one else to teach me. Mm -hmm. And I learned to track on my own. And, uh, and it's been really a lifelong, uh, I don't know, fascination for me to, uh, every time I go to the wilderness, every time I go to the forest or go camping, I'm just, uh, in, uh, reflexively I'm tracking everything that's been through here or uh, in the last you know two or three days 
I can read the age of signs and, and uh, I can tell you what it was and where it was going and uh, where it's been, where it lives. Because mm -hmm. uh, animals are like, uh, they have, the wilderness is like a city. You've got uh, interstates and you've got highways and you've got roads and then you've got streets and you've got driveways. Mm -hmm. And one leads to the other, and animals follow these things just like humans follow roads and streets and uh, interstates. Mm -hmm. And uh, once you learn the system, uh, I can tell you, you know, he passed through here, you know, three or four hours ago. He's headed up uh, this hill, and he probably lives somewhere around those trees. And I'll track him up to earn, and I'll find his, you know, I'll eventually find his. Uh, driveway and find it where he's living Ooh. and uh no i saw so i spent my whole life doing it and i thought but what if you you had to track something that was like a ghost that didn't leave a sign mm -hmm. that was uh that was too intelligent to track and uh so the story just developed started developing in my mind and i thought and what if this thing was prehistorically powerful mm -hmm. and had seriously bad intentions. And, uh, and uh, that's basically how the story evolved in my mind. And then I, I wrote it and, uh, you know, Simon and Schuster bought it. And uh, Sylvester Stallone, he loved it from the first. And uh, he added a lot to it on the psychological part of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, we, uh, like I said, the, the story evolved over a period of a year. Mm -hmm. uh, it took me about a year to write it. And uh, where it began um, is almost nothing like how it ended. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I began with a skeleton. But when uh, of a story, but when I finished, it was really a full blown had flesh and blood and bones and I mean you know I mean it was a, it was a living the story lives mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, on its own. That that actually leads into the next question. Um, what do you think? Uh, like, did Sylvester see in this that made him enthusiastic about the story? Well, I think uh, he's a man that just naturally doesn't quit, doesn't give up, doesn't give in, mm -hmm. and uh, he accepts challenges. He he considers challenges to be more of a privilege than uh, anything else because mm -hmm. he's uh, he's he's around to accept it, and 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 uh, he uh, he he began reading the story. And he began seeing all these variations of uh, how you how I could improve it and enhance it rather. And uh, he began running these ideas past me. And you know, <clears throat> one of them just struck both of us as uh, perfect for the story. And uh, I began focusing on that and adding that to the story. Mm -hmm. And that added the psychological depth. Than the, and the horror to the story, and uh, <clears throat> and that's uh you know the story wasn't born uh, full grown. I mean it was it was born as the the cell of an idea of a story, mm -hmm. and over a period of working on it and researching it and writing it over and over and over again and probably a hundred discussions with Stallone. We finally, it finally evolved to what it is uh, on the on the page now. Okay. So, uh, you know, that's amazing. Um, what sort of uh, of research did you do to create the book? Well, like I said, I, I've spent most of my life uh, in the wilderness. And so I didn't need, really need to do a lot of, of research uh, about the wilderness, but I did read a lot of books 
I always do when I write uh, when I write a novel. I'll read you know upwards of a hundred books mm -hmm. about any given subject before I begin to even write about it. Mm -hmm. So I, it, it can take me, me longer to research how to a subject than to write the novel of uh, what uh, it is. It involves, um, like, uh, I can say safely, I, I spent six months researching Hunter and how to write it and where it was, where I wanted to take it and what I wanted it to uh, uh, bec become mm -hmm. before I ever wrote a single word. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah, sometimes also, too, research is like a really great fun part of any project you know well, like, it's like dark visions I mean I walked around three months with a blindfold on that's before I and uh, and then I sat down and just went over different versions of how to begin it for it took six weeks mm -hmm. something like that. and then I began writing the book so you know I was safely you know uh, four and a half almost five months into researching dark visions before I ever wrote the first chapter. Wow! And then I then I rewrote the first chapter over two hundred times before I could settle in on the tone mm -hmm. of the characters mm -hmm. and uh, how I wanted them to, uh, you know, uh, be fulfilled on the page because mm -hmm. I wanted full blown characters. I didn't want you know uh, silhouettes of, of characters and uh and that takes time you know it takes a lot of thought takes a lot of research takes a lot of experience and you have to combine all those together along with everything else that you know mm -hmm. and uh you bring it all to the page and you leave it on the page awesome awesome i, I can definitely say like doing a lot of different shows i do and stuff research is always one like one of my favorite parts about it because Sometimes you'll research something, and then that will lead you to something else. And next thing you know, instead of instead of one idea for something, you got twenty or thirty. You know. Yeah, but and and you know, you, you might go through ten thousand pages. You might read ten thousand pages, but out of that ten thousand pages, you might find one page. Yeah. That that gives you the, the genesis of an idea. Yeah. And it's and to me, it's worth it. It's worth the time. It's oh, worth definitely. The you know? Yeah, definitely worth it. Um, I'll read a lot of books, and I'll just kind of toss them aside because I'll, I'll say to myself, well, this, that was, a, you know, useless. <laughs> you know, there was nothing in there that I can use. Yeah, we all find and those. <laughs> I might read 10 books like that, mm -hmm. you know, but then I'll find that one page in one book and I, or and maybe one paragraph in on one page. But in that paragraph, there will be some cell of an idea that will uh, get me thinking in a certain direction, mm -hmm. and uh, then I'll then I'll start developing an original uh, concept uh, and get more focused, change the direction of my research, and. Uh, uh, eventually, I'll begin writing. Mm -hmm. But it takes me a long time to get to the point where I begin writing. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm kind of the same way. Like I, I, I have all these like, I have like hundreds and hundreds of these uh, notebooks. And what I do is I just go over notes and I go over like skeletal designs for everything I do. And sometimes I'll do that like, you know, fifty to a hundred times before I even start something. Like I'll go yeah. through. I got tons. My wife's always like, get rid of all those notebooks. But I got, you know, just tons and tons of, I can totally relate to that. Um, can you, what, what can you tell us a little bit about the lead character, about, you know, Nathaniel? Like, what's he like for people he's who stoic. might not know? He's a stoic, he's stoic, he's strong, uh, he's a very self-reliant. And uh, resourceful. He's extremely intelligent, and he's a uh, 
he has a certain um he doesn't care about things that normal people care about mm. like uh most people care about the weather he doesn't care about the weather because you know he's lived outside most of his life mm -hmm. you know you know if it's, if it's raining it's raining you know he doesn't try and put on a poncho or hide from the rain but he, he uh he just ignores it mm -hmm. uh you know he knows what to do to survive the cold and the and, uh, and the heat and uh, so uh, and money it is not important to him although he does have a great deal of money because he his philosophy of life is he doesn't need that much mm -hmm. most people are very concerned about having a very nice house but to him a house means almost nothing mm -hmm. he, he could he could be happy just living at, in a log cabin yeah you know I mean just something to keep you know the snow off his head or the you know keep him warm you know during the coldest parts of the year but uh, although although oh, he's rich uh, he's uh, just uh, ambivalent about money. Okay. And uh, he, he he hasn't had any close relationships in his life because he's grew, grown up mostly by himself. But in this book, he he, de he develops the first close relationship he's ever had, and uh, he discovers things about himself in this book. Uh, from these emotions that he has never experienced, and uh, uh, it's a, he's, he changes the character Hunter changes as the book progresses. All the characters change. Mm -hmm. They're changed by this experience uh, in different ways. Excellent. Um, what, what, what is, so what, what are some of the things you, uh, you hoped to, uh, accomplish when you were designing to tell a story like this? Well, I, I just have, I'm, a, I'm just, a, I don't really have sophisticated reasons for why I do what I do. I just love great stories. I love telling great stories. I love watching great movies or reading great books. Uh, I don't have any uh, uh, complex philosophy about it. I'm just kind of like the old fashioned troubadour. They used to stand up by the campfire at night and tell a story to mesmerize everybody, mm -hmm. and, you know, entertain everybody <laughs> before they went to bed. You know. Yes. Oh, I thought that was on my side. Uh, I thought that was my so wife's uh, blackberry. <laughs> I meant to cut this thing off. Go ahead. <clears throat> no problem, no problem. Yeah, I, I also found that there's a, a lot of great changes in the, in the book, too. The people go through a lot of different things, and I don't want to give too much of that away, but... Um, it's definitely it's definitely like a thinking person's book when they pick it up they and it not only that but it really does transport you to another place you know and it really takes you to the depths of of the unbring unbring backable sort of situation of everything um what is uh, you know I, I I mentioned a, a, one of my favorite parts of the book before but what uh, what is your favorite part of the book of uh, Hunter? Yeah. My favorite part is uh, when Hunter finally realizes what he's tracking. And he realizes how deadly it is. And that it's nothing that this world has seen in a million years. Mm -hmm. And it's even worse than it was when it existed a million years ago. Because this is a, an aberration, a 
hybrid creation, and the dark, and it and it, and it's more powerful than it was in, you know, before. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, and 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 going on off that is, uh, you know, like what are maybe some of the themes you regularly regularly find yourself writing about? I know we've talked about uh, some things with Hunter, and we've talked about a little bit about Dark Visions, and I think uh, off the air we talked about Kane and a couple of other ones. But what kind of uh, what kind of themes do you usually find yourself writing about? I always tend to gravitate towards a, a central theme of the battle of the eternal battle between good and evil. Mm -hmm. All my books in some way have that reflection and have that substance within them. Yeah, and, a good balance and, there. Uh, I just wanted to add the element of ordinary people trapped in extraordinary situations and they, they have to become extraordinary in order to survive. And, and they're basically good people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and they're not evil, but they're just ordinary, mm -hmm. you know, and, but they have to become ex extraordinary in, a, in various ways in order to survive something evil, mm -hmm. to fight, to fight it off, to destroy it. You know, to say not only themselves, but maybe, you know, the world. Mm -hmm. And once um, again, that touches back to the great themes of change that you were talking about earlier, too. Right, and an experience like that changes you. Yeah. Because I've been through, I consider myself an ordinary person, but I've been through a lot of situations where I've had to do things that were quite extraordinary. And uh, normally, you know, you don't go around doing those things. Mm -hmm. You know, normally there's no reason to. Mm -hmm. And nobody wants to, mm -hmm. you know, not, uh, to, to put their life on the line like that. But, uh, but sometimes, you know, you, you, you look at a situation and you, you, you know you've got to do something. Yeah. That you wouldn't normally do, and yeah. uh, so uh, I, you know, I, I took that experience. That also kind of falls back to testing our metal, you know, to do the right thing over the wrong thing, no matter how hard or what we have to sacrifice. You know, right. stay true to ourselves. And um, what would you say is the hardest part about writing a book? Um, the rewriting and the constant rewriting and the constant rethinking yeah. and the self criticism that you have to inflict on yourself yeah. you know, in order to uh, to write the truest sentence you can write in the fewest words you can use. That's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Now anybody can drone on and on and on for pages about something, but to capture that uh, concept in four words is a challenge. Yeah. And 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 that's where uh, I I find the most challenging part of what I do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I came as I've, I've come as close to achieving satisfaction with my own techniques of, of reaching that goal with dark visions than I have with any other book I've ever written. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, Hunter, Hunter was, uh, you know, close too. Yeah. Um, but uh, every book presents uh, its own challenges, its own different types of challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but my 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 thing tend to run towards the eternal battle between good and evil that I feel is a real a very real thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, our ending question is uh, 
I actually I, I opened up with this with one of my with one of the questions I submitted earlier. Uh, I guess I got it twice here, but it gives you a good time to uh, go back and and maybe add some more onto this. Is uh maybe who were some of the writers who influenced your writing? Some uh, additional ones. Well, different writers influenced me in different ways. Um, Edgar Allan Poe influenced me a great a great deal concerning atmosphere. Mm -hmm. I like Gothic atmosphere. Uh, Bram Stoker influenced me as far as um, setting up a contest between good and evil. Uh, and uh, uh, so Arthur Conan Doyle, I uh, absorbed a lot from him, mm -hmm. uh, characters of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, I liked the way he described Holmes and uh, how Holmes evolved. Uh, and uh, Robert E. Howard had an influence on me. Mm -hmm. I liked his style. He uh, created, he never liked the term sword and sorcery genre but it was applied to him. He created the character of Conan the Barbarian and, and a lot of other you know, famous characters, but he had a certain way of, of a rhythm that I admired and uh, I, uh, I learned you know, over de a decade or so of, re of reading of various uh, fantasy writers and various science fiction writers Everybody has a different cadence and a different rhythm and a, a different different way of uh, voicing a, a character. Mm -hmm. And and it just takes long. It takes years, <clears throat> decades, really, to to uh, absorb all these different kinds of techniques and learn them. Mm -hmm. And then we, when you sit down to write your own novel, you got you got a hundred different techniques in your mind and a hundred you learn to have to do this a hundred different ways and and so it, you can just pick the right way to do it for your book no but if you don't know if you're not constantly reading if you're not constantly learning you have nothing to draw from yeah yeah so very true um Wow! Wow! Well, did you have do you have anything else you want to add? You want to throw in there? Um, I was gonna ask you where can uh, where can we find you online for the people at home who might not know where to find you? Well, right now we're setting up um, the best the best place to find me is my Facebook page. Uh, but. Uh, we're working on other ways to make me more accessible to people who want to talk to me uh, or want to, uh, you know, uh, discuss projects mm -hmm. uh, okay. like that. Okay, so when, when that's out, we'll, uh, we'll get that out for everybody so everyone can join you over there. And, uh, okay. Man, I don't, I don't want this to end. I'm having such a great time doing this with you. Uh, this is my the favorite part of what I do is talking to people of similar minds who and we can just sit around and talk ideas and what we like and don't like and why we like something. Mm -hmm. That's more fascinating to me than what somebody likes. I yeah. like to ask, okay, you you like it, so, but why do you like it so much? Mm -hmm. You know, explain to me why you find that fascinating. What what what, what is it about that character? that you do like yeah and, uh, you know and stuff like that awesome. now, I could sit around all week long with you just you and me kicking up my ideas back and forth talking about why we like this and why we don't like that and you know yeah wish they would have done it this way instead of that way because it would have been better because of this reason or that reason Mm -hmm. And you know, just the creative process, just the creativity uh, is what I love. And that's why I love sitting down with, you know, people who read my books or uh, uh, 
people with similar interests, you know, mm -hmm. as me. Well, I know I, I always uh, really enjoy talking to you when we get together and have like our Facebook chats and stuff like that. It's, it's uh, phenomenal. I always I always leave with uh, a lot on my mind to ask you about the next time because it just opens things and opens things. And it's always it's always fun to explore, uh, like the characters and you know the themes and the the meanings behind the work and it's just uh, it's incredible. It's incredible. Gee. Well, I'm, I'm always learning from people, and I think that when you stop learning, you stop growing. Yeah. And when you stop, and when you stop growing, you uh, uh, you basically become a very unhappy person. Yeah, very uh, true. You know, life is a journey. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, for anybody who thinks they quote unquote arrived, uh, I can tell them right now that you haven't. <laughs> yeah. I mean, life is. Life is every day. Mm -hmm. uh, learn something new. Yeah, yeah, definitely. W without a doubt, without a doubt. I know. Like, for me, it, it it's weird. Like I spent the first half of my my life really involved with music and film, and so far, like the second half of my life has been very much going into. Well, I can't say the second half of my life. I'll say like the last six to ten years has been. Uh, going getting into literature you know going back and reading all those things that i mislooked when i was younger and you know researching movie scripts and researching alternate things uh you know things that we ne we we never saw that we were supposed to see and uh it's an amazing it's an amazing 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 journey and to be able to like to read some of your works too is just an amazing uh privilege just a, well, yeah. I, a lot of people uh, think that what I do is a job, but to me, it's a it's a passion. Yeah. And and then it shows. I I can't see myself doing anything else. Yeah. Really? Because I mean, I've done a lot of other things, and uh, I've been good at a lot of other things. Uh, but you know, I didn't do them with passion. Um, mm -hmm. I, I did them because it was my job, and I did it well. I learned how to do it safely, you know. I learned how to do it well, mm -hmm. and I did it. Yeah. But it, I didn't love it, mm -hmm. you know. And and but what I do now, creating these uh, images, these stories, these books, this is my love, and that's you know. I'm glad I'm. I've got the opportunity to do it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you 100% on that, and I can relate to that 110%. Well, this is so awesome. Uh, thank you, James, once again for coming on and talking with us. This was just uh, a, this is a, a, literally a dream come true to be able to do this with you. Well, it is it's a dream come true for me, too. I mean, I, I, I love answering uh, these questions. And uh, I love spending time with uh, guys like you. You know, we both share similar interests, and we both love similar types of uh, literature and entertainment. We both are big movie fans, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, you know, to uh, match uh, minds with you, you know, over these uh, things that we we both love uh, is a is a privilege for me. You know. Thank you very much. Yes, the pleasure was all mine. You know, getting to know you over the over the time that we I've, I've known you, this is just uh, like I said, it's a dream come true, uh, milestone moment for me. Um, so with that, I hope everyone enjoyed the show tonight. Uh, it's a little over time, but you know, we uh, wanted to get everybody in and make sure everybody got uh, to ask their questions. And once again, thank you for answering them, James. And I guess everybody have a really safe and happy Halloween and uh, you know uh, enjoy first blood week 1982 week right 36 years this week and once again happy and safe Halloween to everybody and thank you all for listening in tonight uh, this was just phenomenal thank you James it has been my pleasure all right guys we'll catch you later have a good night